Thank you for joining us. This is Discussions of War here on the Battleship North Carolina. I'm Jeff Smith, and we're here talking about Vietnam. Now, I'm joined by Rossi Nance, Elizabeth Cannon, and Lonnie Davenport. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, Rossi, let's start with you. What was it like? What did you do in Vietnam? I arrived in Vietnam about 118 degrees. The smell was terrible. Ten hours hot food on a helicopter out to the jungles. I was sent to the 1st Cavalry Division. I was communication sergeant, and my job was to maintain communication regardless of what was going on. Very difficult task. I only spent six months, 18 days in Vietnam. I was shipped out to Walter Reed Medical Center, spent another five months and 18 days in the hospital. Make it simple. <laughs> I want to tell you about my homecoming. I was awakened one morning by a doctor. He says, Rossi, what are you doing here? You discharged us today. Here's your plane ticket. Go home. Just to that fact. They put me on a bus from Washington, D.C. to Columbus County. I was dropped off seven miles from my home at like three in the morning. No way to get home, so I start walking. Somehow, I don't know how, my mother came and found me and picked me up. She had an inkling I was coming home. But the homecoming, other than family, was basically terrible. Um, finding employment in the early 70s was very difficult. If I went to an employer and applied for a job with my skills, basically I was told, you're a Vietnam veteran? Yes. We don't have any openings. And, and that went on and on and on. For myself, there was never this welcome home. Uh, Later in life, wife, two kids, beautiful family, to this day it still is. I went, I found employment with the federal government at a facility that ships all the explosives to the world, Sunny Point. Mm -hmm. And there I spent my life in a secure facility working with more veterans. And to this day, since I didn't receive the welcome home that I thought I should have, I devoted my life to helping other veterans that needed me tremendously. Yeah. That's my life, Jeff. <laughs> now, Liz, you, yeah. you represent a part of Vietnam that's not talked about a lot, uh, the female aspect. Now, you're a Viet Vietnam-era veteran. Talk yeah. about your service. Uh, just uh, immediately after I got out of high school, I enlisted uh, in the United States Army. Long story short. Uh, they sent me to school, and I was a transportation movement specialist. And uh, when I got out of the Army, I, I went to a basic training, uh, not basic training, I'm sorry, the two-week uh, summer camp with my reserve unit. And uh, I never did come back home. I ended up back on active duty, went to another school, and I was a recruiter and career counselor. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, it's kind of strange for women, you know, most of the time we're just plainly invisible and uh, it's tough, it's just tough. Uh, there wasn't much call for a transportation specialist unless I wanted to work as a stevedore. <laughs> uh, so the job situation is much like Rossi's. Hey. You are a Vietnam era veteran, and you're just as crazy as the other ones. Go on down the highway. I did. I attempted to go to school and uh, use my GI Bill, and I was very unsuccessful with that. Uh, I did not fit in. Uh, I was the oddball. You couldn't put me in a pigeonhole. I simply did not fit. And I spent years wondering what was wrong with me. And I did eventually find out what was wrong with me. And it's called post-traumatic stress disorder. It has caused buku heartache. My parents were almost ashamed of me for having been in the military. And uh, uh, my mother didn't even you know, say, I'm glad you're home. No, it's good to see you, Liz. <laughs> that was it. And uh, certainly my classmates didn't. And I was really quite the lone wolf. 
for many, many, many years. And uh, once I found out what was wrong with me and got the appropriate care and treatment and support group, uh, I was compelled to reach out uh, to other veterans, my brothers, my sisters, and they were my heroes, and they still are. Now, Lonnie, you get to bring in the Marine side of things, uh, your Vietnam experience. Talk about your time in war and, and then coming home as well. Um, joining the Marine Corps right out of high school, they expected me to get drafted, but I had already signed up. I got the papers. Uh, got in. I didn't go to Vietnam right away. I joined in 1966. I got my orders. Surprisingly, um, well, I left Camp Lejeune to go to to process my orders to go to Vietnam two days before I turned 21. Uh, going to Vietnam wasn't so much of an issue. Um, the going home to prepare for Vietnam had some negative connotation and I kind of had to deal with that and I reported Got there, I thought I was going to go straight to a unit, went on mess duty for 30 days, and that was kind of like, mm -hmm. okay, this is, this is where I'm supposed to be. When I first reported to my unit the first night I got there, we got incoming. Mm -hmm. uh, Vietnam was a, an experience of life changing. The people you met, the, the, the rigors of war was life-changing. It made you grow up. It, it made you look at life from a different perspective. The individuals you encountered made you see that m what was actually going on at that period of time in the 60s in America really didn't matter in war. So I had those experiences with people that who never would have met if I'd have stayed in Louisiana. You know, people from Texas, um, Montana, Ohio, M Michigan, Massachusetts, all of these people. And it made a, a well-rounded life change. But coming, before even coming home, Vietnam was, you can't even describe what that was like because all the things that were going on. And coming home was almost as traumatic because when I got to the airport, the funny thing before I even got to, to New Orleans is that when we landed, the guy said, oh, you're here, you come home on Marine Corps birthday, we're gonna give you the night, the day off, and it's 11.45 at night and the Marine Corps birthday is already over. But coming home, getting to the airport, like basically like Rossi, I got there and there was nobody to pick me up. And uh, during that time, th th there were limos service, and the limos cost, I think, five, ten dollars to drive from the airport into downtown. And there was this limo driver that had the courtesy, looked at me and told me, hey, you're just coming home from Vietnam get in the car and I'll take you home. And that was probably the best, the best thing that happened in my coming home. Uh, I stayed in, I, I, I had a, a, another assignment where I went back overseas and it, it was kind of like a health. It took me out of the pressure. And then coming home and not being able so much to get a job. Uh, the only people that would, for me in my instance, the only person that hired me was another veteran. And when he left, the guy that came in wasn't a veteran and that caused all kind of issues. So not knowing, as, as Liz said, you're suffering with a traumatic experience that is affecting your emotions and I think the only thing that saved me from doing something that I probably would have regretted is I enjoyed being home and being free after coming back from a, a war zone and seeing the oppressions of that 
particular environment. So, and it didn't change. You know, years later, um, I had an experience where the guy just didn't bother. He thought I was, you know, overstepping my bounds. And, and it was a good thing and a bad thing because it allowed me to go back on active duty, which kind of was like a relief because I was back in my environment where I felt comfortable among other, because it was still Vietnam veterans still in the Marine Corps at that time. And that was that, was that kind of calming thing that you needed not to come out and have what had, I had experienced happen. So that was one of the better and some of the worst things that happened to me in Vietnam, going, going and coming home. So, you know, that's, that's the crux of the beginning of my, my return. <laughs> It's interesting. You, right now, we're here on the North Carolina battleship from World War II, is where this uh, ship sailed. And it's the war. Everyone was a hero that came back. Everyone was treated so respectfully. It was, you know, it was America's great triumph. You guys didn't have that opportunity to come back in that atmosphere. You don't have a battleship here to, to go celebrate uh, Vietnam. What is that like to be on board here and have, the, but still know that you served your country proudly? It's a feeling of sanctuary here on the ship. It's kind of like we're at peace with ourselves now. For my first 40, 40, 42 years at home, I fought that war and I still, I was fighting it. And one day I, I became peace with myself. I accepted what I had done in Vietnam and how it happened and the horrors, and when I became at peace with myself, it smoothed out. But to come to a place like this and know what the battleship done and the men and women that served on this, it, it's, it's, it's peaceful to me. So. Liz, you, you get to work, all of you get to work with other veterans and, and, and get to you know, communicate with other veterans. How does that help? I know you mentioned it just a second ago about how you got to work, uh, a veteran hired you. How does that community come together, especially since Vietnam? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> we're brothers and sisters. We're a family. We're a family. Now, we may get mad at each other and want to bite each other's heads off, uh, but the truth is is that uh, we were in it together, and it, it's a tie that binds. And it, when we're there helping another veteran, it gives us purpose, and uh, it gives me peace. <laughs> it really does. It gives me peace, and being here on this battleship is uh, like standing on holy ground. It's like going to Arlington National Cemetery. It's like going to Eighth and I and seeing the uh, beautiful thing that the Marine Corps do there. The Marine Corps does there, and uh, it's just sacred. It's just sacred, and it's a privilege, and it's an honor, and it humbles us to be able to reach out. I, we know what the other one's experiencing. Nobody knows, like we know, what's going on with a fellow Vietnam veteran, or any other veteran for that matter. So. Being on this uh, battleship, I was on here, I think, before I went to Vietnam, but coming back, and even then, it was um, sort of a brotherhood. As the Marines and the Navy, they always served together. And so this was one of um, maybe a sanctuary or, or a comradeship that most people don't ever experience. Being in the military, being to say that it didn't matter what branch of the service you were in, when we met one another, especially after coming home from Vietnam, we had a camaraderie, we had a bond, we had an understanding, we had a, a fellowship in one another that uh, was beyond what other people would understand. Um, to be on this ship, to know that um, Everybody that's name is written on that wall was there for one another. And any time somebody lost their lives, it affected the whole ship. 
And it was the same way in Vietnam when someone in the unit was lost or someone that was close that you knew that lost it, it affected everybody. So being here, yeah, it's like a place of comfort, but it's also a place of understanding what war is about. Uh, you were mentioning earlier, go ahead, you were talking earlier, there's a lot of other discussions that have to continue here. You know, I asked for this to be a very open discussion because a lot of people don't, have been holding back. It's time to let out. Yeah, one thing Liz and Lonnie and I were talking about prior to coming on the ship today, none of us have sat down with our children and our wives and told them about Vietnam. I don't know if it's our fortitude to sit down and talk to them. I don't know if it's the emotional aspect. I know we need to do that, but I don't know how. I don't know how to accomplish that. Liz, Lonnie? You know, all of my kids uh, are grown. And um, there were bits and pieces of things that I would kind of mention to my kids but never sat down and told him and said, you know, I don't remember the day. And I know that I was at this place for this amount of time. I can't tell him about when I was in this bunker and what happened. I can't tell him what happened on that January morning and, and being stuck. And, and I can't explain that. Uh, and, and, it, and, and it's kind of, it, See, coming home, people calling you names and not knowing the sacrifice that you made, that makes you angry to say that, yes, there's discussions that need to be made. Uh, we, we as a group, we as veterans probably need to find a way for us to come together and just, hey, laugh, pray, cry, do whatever it is to get that off of you. Um, like Rossi, you come, you come to peace with yourself. But the underlying current of what you experience never, ever, ever goes away. And that is the part that I don't think we could really discuss with anybody except maybe another veteran or somebody that's You know, you, you may be able to discuss it with a veteran from two Korea, Vietnam, and all the the new the two things that are going on now. But uh, to discuss it with somebody that has no understanding of what you experience and thinking that that was you know it's still written in history that was a that was a wrong war. We were we were murderers. We were baby killers. We were all of these things in. How do you overcome that? How do you overcome that stigma? That's, that's going to be the question. Yes, we need to talk about it. We need, uh, when you say you need to talk about it, you need to get over this. Uh, okay. My first experience being welcome home, and I don't know, Rossi used to mess with me when we was working at Sunnyport. You need to come, you need to come, you need to come. He could tell me welcome home, but nobody else could. And, and that, that's, that's, where it, that's, that's where it is. And do we understand? We don't, I don't think we really understand to the degree that we can share this. What can, let's say my generation or my kids' generation, which would be grandkids, uh, great-grandchildren to some of the Vietnam veterans over the, earlier on, and what can we do to make sure that we are honoring you and that we are able to start any healing process that can happen? Jeff, if I had to say one thing, I would tell you, my children, grandchildren, and mine do it, if they're in a grocery store, Walmart, something like that, and they see a hat, go shake the person's hand, regardless, say, welcome home, thank you. That's basically all can be done for veterans. That's, that's my opinion. Is there anything on, on your opinion? Um, well, I, I, I agree with Lonnie. I agree with Rossi. Um, 
the most important thing I think to remember is that all of our military personnel on active duty or reserve component or those who have served and are just good old veteran. The most important thing is to, to share the human aspect of what it means to truly, to be a soldier, uh, to be an airman, to be, uh, you know, a Marine. Uh, because honestly, John Q. Public doesn't have a clue. They have no clue. And uh, it's an awareness issue too, I believe. Uh, if we don't educate the public about what's going on with their veterans and their service members, well, who is? You know? So we have to depend on uh, uh, folks like you, UNC TV, uh, and other, uh, you know, different outlets, be it uh, social media or whatever. Uh, we just really need to continue to educate ourselves, our families, and others. Never give up. What do you get out of being a group? Like the, Viet the Vietnam Vet Veterans of America, how does that? I'll show you. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. Yeah, that's what it's all about. We're there for each other. Mm -hmm. That example he just gave is the same example that you experience when you're in a hostile environment. Bullets don't discriminate. Mm -hmm. Blood is always red. Sorrow is the sorrow no matter where it's at. Whether, it uh, doesn't matter. You ask, how can we educate? You know, it's gonna have to be, it's gonna have to be documented like you know, this, this interview and Ken Burns and other interviews uh, to get a real perspective. Uh, talk to the, the younger generation, let them know some of the real facts about what we experience, uh, what, it, what it's really like uh, to be there. Uh, Rossi shared something I, I'd have never known that that was it. And I did. Can I say something again? <laughs> Jeff, we fought a war in Vietnam and we came home and we thought that war was over. But little does the American public know that we're still fighting a war. Yes. We're fighting a war with Agent Orange dioxins. Mm -hmm. That's affecting our children with disabilities, our grandchildren with disabilities. And according to the Ford Foundation, it could go on five generations behind us. And we can't get the VA and our government to actually recognize that to help our siblings. Mm -hmm. So that, that war will continue until we're gone. Yeah, so, I'm Hopefully we'll continue to find ways to bring healing as well as to get the information out. I really appreciate you all sharing your service and sharing your stories here today. And this has been Discussions of War here on the Battleship. The discussion continues online at nchannel.org slash veterans. There you will find videos from discussions of war, stories of service, North Carolina Veterans Coffee, and more. Upload your own stories of service directly to our site. You can also follow us on social media to learn about local veteran events across North Carolina. Thank you.
I'm Jeff Smith, Military and Veterans Affairs Coordinator for UNC TV. And I'm Larry Hall, Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. We're here to serve you, our veteran and active duty men and women, with information and resources available across North Carolina. We want you to know that no matter where you are in this state, we're here for you with the resources you and your family need. Please visit ncforvets.com for your benefits and information home. Thank you. North Carolina Channel is made possible by the financial contributions of viewers like you who support the UNC-TV network.